Hope you all are uh, excited today, full of energy. Um, thank you so much for being here with us the last few days. It's hard to believe that uh, our conference is already winding down. It looks, felt like it just started three days ago. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a, a year-long endeavor for the OSCO staff, and uh, we, we really enjoy being here, and, and it's always a little sad uh, on the last day because things are winding down, and then uh, we go outside and they start tearing, tearing apart our registration desk and everything. Hey, wait, stop, that's our registration desk, put it back. <laughs> so, um, but we really appreciate all of you uh, joining us. I hope you've had a great time. Hope you, uh, as tired as some of you may be, I hope you feel re-energized to go back to your districts with some, with some new information, some new programs that you can put into practice uh, right away or at the start of the school year. So you can really make a difference in the lives of your students <coughs> and the people you work with. <coughs> Last night, we had the opportunity to, opportunity to celebrate some outstanding school counseling programs from across the country. Uh, we recognize 72 RAMP schools from 17 states. And if you're a school counselor at one of those schools, please stand and let's give you a big round of applause. Hmm. Congratulations to all of you, and thank you for all your hard work. Uh, we also want to say congratulations to the winners of the Conference by Coloring Contest, sponsored by Wentworth Institute of Technology, the I Can Color Contest. Our first honorable mention, uh, Patricia Ludi Lutu Mays of Strawberry Plains, Tennessee, wins a specialist training of her choice, and this is the one that was selected. Uh, our second honorable... Our second honorable mention is Erin Revling of Hanover, Pennsylvania. And she wins a, a one-year uh, ASCA membership. And our first prize winner is Crystal Feldner of Coleman, Alabama. And she, uh, she wins a, a free registration to the conference next year in Phoenix. If they're not here today, we'll contact all the winners and, and make all the arrangements. Um, congratulations to all of the winners, and thank you to all of you who participated in the contest. I hope you had fun. It was a, a nice way to, to get a more green bag this year and, and just do something fun with the exhibitors and, and with, for you all. And now we have a very special message from the Secretary of Education. Hi, I'm Arnie Duncan, and thank you so much for this opportunity to join your conference. Our nation's school counselors are absolutely essential resources for our nation's students. And you play a vital role in ensuring their success, especially for students from low income and disadvantaged families who often need additional support in making decisions about how to reach their college and career goals. In many cases, you represent the one meaningful adult relationship that a student can count on to meet their social, emotional, physical, and academic needs. To improve student outcomes, it takes a holistic approach. And your work connects students to resources outside the classroom, guiding students onto the right track. You understand the critical importance of improving school climate, keeping our nation's schools safe, and ensuring access to high quality learning opportunities, as well as creating bridges to college and careers. I'm so thrilled that recently our nation crossed the 80% mark in high school graduation rates. That's the highest rate we have ever seen, and congratulations on all the hard work to help us get to that point. But we all know that we live in a time when a high school diploma alone simply doesn't secure a spot in the middle class or give an opportunity to pursue a fulfilling career. This makes your work truly instrumental in ensuring that our students understand the importance of a post-secondary education, whether that be at a trade school, college, or through post-high school programs leading to a career. And yet, many schools have inadequate staffing for counselors. Our Office for Civil Rights found that one in five high schools lacks, doesn't have, a guidance counselor. 
This inadequate staffing can mean the difference between success or failure as a young person moves through school. Yet, in the face of these very real challenges, all of you do your work with persistence, compassion, and tremendous respect, showing our students how much you care about them. Children across the nation greatly need and appreciate you, and I want to personally applaud your collective commitment to this work. We need you to continue to open doors to the future and give hope to all of our students. Thank you so much for what you do and the difference you make in our students' lives each and every day. And we want to thank Secretary Duncan for all his support and his department's support uh, through the years. Uh, we've developed a good relationship with him and have collaborated on several programs. And we look forward to a continued uh, relationship and more collaboration. So we, we truly thank him for all he and his department have done. And now we're honored to introduce you to five uh, very special school counselors who are doing extraordinary work themselves uh, every day to support their, their students. Sorry. Uh. If you ever find yourself stuck in the middle of the sea, I'll sail the world to find you. If you ever find yourself lost in the dark and you can't see, I'll be the light to guide you. Find out what we're made of When we are called to help our friends in need You can't count on me Like one, two, three I'll be there And I know when I need it I can count on you Like four, three, two And you'll be there Cause that's what friends are supposed to do, oh yeah Ooh, ooh, yeah, yeah If you're tossing and you're turning and you just can't fall asleep I'll sing a song beside you And if you ever forget how much you really mean to me Every day I will remind you, oh, find out what we're made of, when we are called to help our friends in need, you can't count on me, like one, two, three, I'll be there, and I know That's what friends are supposed to do, oh yeah The School Council of the Year of the program is one of our uh, favorite programs of the year, and it's become one of the cornerstones of what we do. And so this year's uh, finalists are Melissa Beverly, School Counselor at Cactus Shadows High School in Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> Timothy M. Conway, School Counseling and Curriculum Coordinator at Lakeland Regional High School in Wanakee, New Jersey. Monica A. Dominguez, the lead school counselor at Dr. Sue Shook Elementary School in El Paso, Texas. And Linda Martin, school counselor at Palm Lake Elementary School right here in Orlando.
And now please welcome our 2014 School Counselor of the Year, Robin Zorn from M.H. Mason Elementary School in Duluth, Georgia. Also with us today are a few of our past School Counselor of the Years. Uh, please stand, uh, Tammy McCabin from El Paso, um, Julie Hartline from Georgia, and Bar Barbara Matucci from Pennsylvania, and Min Mindy Willard from Arizona. Thank you. Where we're going to be next year. Let's give everyone, a, everyone of them a big round of applause. Congratulations and thank you for all your hard work and everything you do for your students and for school counseling. And now, please welcome Robin Zorn. Thank you. Good morning. It has been such an honor to represent all of you as the 2014 National School Counselor of the Year. And as the conference comes to a close, I am so excited to take back everything that I have learned that I wish school would start tomorrow. Now, my kids would probably beg to differ, though. I have two teenage daughters, and so they're all about that summer vacation. But I have made such awesome new friends, like our keynote today, Rosalind, and many others. And I hope that you all have had that chance to connect and make some new friends um, around the whole United States. So as the year gets tough, and we know it will, because we are counselors and it just is what it is. I want you to remember the words of Winnie the Pooh, because I am a huge Disney fan, so this was very perfect for this to be this year. You are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. So remember that. Thank you for everything that you all do each and every day. And now it is my honor and my privilege to introduce our keynote for today. Most famously, the author of Queen Bees and Wannabes, the groundbreaking and best-selling book that was the basis for the movie Mean Girls. Rosalind Weissman is an internationally recognized expert on children, teens, parenting, bullying, and social justice. Her latest best-selling book, Masterminds and Wingmen, published in September of 2013, offers insights into what matters most to boys. In 2013, she was appointed as an advisor to the U.S. Department of Health, Human Services, Substance Abuse, and Mental Health Administration. In 2011, she was one of the principal speakers at the White House Summit on Bullying. National media regularly depends on Wiseman as the expert on bullying intervention, parenting, ethical leadership, and the use of social media. She is a consultant for Cartoon Network's Speak Up, Stop, Bu Stop Bullying campaign and has been profiled in the New York Times, People, and USA Today. Wiseman is a frequent guest on the Today Show, Anderson Cooper 360, CNN, Good Morning America, and NPR affiliates throughout the country. She is also a good friend to ASCA, and we are so happy that she is with us here today. Please join me in welcoming Rosalind Weissman. because you're worried about some of the kids that you've got. Um, maybe you have a boy that you can't break through to, um, that 
you want to be able, you know that a child has so much potential and you can't get that, right? You can't get through to this kid. Or maybe you're worried because he's being bullied and you know you can't figure out how to get him to a better place about it. So for whatever ways in which you came to the conference to get information, to inform and be better in your own work and to get support from colleagues, I want to start in a way with the end of the conference with this video. As you could hear that parent laughing and the joy of listening to his four, five-year-old son, however that child, how old that child is, it is that joy that we have to bring with us. And it is also that feeling of love that we have to bring with us when our children get into really difficult situations and to see them for what they are. So imagine if you've got this four-year-old child and, you, and he is so joyful and he's not self-conscious at all, right? I mean, how lack of self-conscious is it to be doing something like that in the bathroom, right? Well, fast forward to the when the child is 13, and I want to share with you one of the stories that boys said to me in various iterations for when I was working on masterminds. So you have a son. And he's 13, and he tells you about two weeks before he's going to a swim party that he needs to get a swim shirt, but he doesn't tell you why. Doesn't say anything about it, just says, you know, sort of off the cuff, need to get a swim shirt. So you file it away under, I will go get a swim shirt the next time I see a swim shirt, you know, or like when I'm doing all my other errands. So the two weeks go by, and the party day arrives, and it's the party that his friends are all going to go to an outdoor pool, just like it's happening around the country right now. It's probably happening on the environs of where we are right now. And he's, at the, he's getting ready to go to the party. It's the day of the party, but you can't find him to go. So you call his name, and he doesn't answer. And you start getting aggravated. So then you find him upstairs playing video games, and it looks like there, he has completely forgotten that this party is happening today. And you are annoyed because he is completely over his screen time, right, of what he's supposed to do. And you think that he's addicted, plus he's playing a game that you hate, and you're not even sure how it got into your house in the first place. So you say, like, it is time to go, and he says, like, let me just throw myself off this cliff, or let me just do this next round, or let me just, you know, I just, I have, like, 15 more minutes. And you've got other things to do besides take your child to a swim party, right? You, like, actually have a life, and you would like to actually do things besides take him to this party. So you get annoyed, you turn off the TV, or the screen, excuse me, and he is super aggravated at you, grumpily gets into the car, and you take him to the party. He doesn't talk to you on the way there. You think that it's like he has been definitely watching too much, he's been definitely playing these games too much, this is super aggravating. He gets out of the car, doesn't even say thank you. And you think you are raising a horrible, rude child who's addicted to video games. Two hours later, you come pick him up, you've done your errands, you pick him up on time, he gets into the car, you are absolutely going to, you're like, he was horrible in a pill when I, when I dropped him off, but I'm going to be, you know, like, enthusiastic and nice to him when he gets back into the car. So he gets back into the car, and you see something which is entirely reasonable. You say, how was the party? And he says, fine. And he tries to put his earbuds or his, heads, his earbuds in his ear. 
and you're like, you are kidding me with this. And then you say, well, who is there? And he looks at you like that is the stupidest question in the entire world. And he says, like, you, like, you know who's there. Like, <sighs> and then you start thinking, I really don't like you. And then he doesn't talk to you at all. And then you get back to your house and you have all these groceries like in the car, which are completely obvious. So you've gone grocery shopping. He doesn't even see them, gets out of the car, like close, you know, barely closes the door, goes right back upstairs and turns on the and starts playing the most violent video game that you have. And you think this child is horrible, horrible. There is something wrong with this child. He is rude. He's inconsiderate. As you bring in all of your groceries, he is terrible. You're a terrible parent. It's terrible. But the problem is, is that we don't know what happened at the party. So what happened at the party is that he and his very close group of friends has been, is been the punching bag. The kid within the group of friends that all the kids think they can tease without consequence. And what they've been doing since he started puberty and he has developed moobs, man boobs, is that they've been teasing him relentlessly. And as the other boys have been going through puberty, their bodies have like sort of flattened out. And so they are teasing him constantly for having moves, which is the reason that he wanted the swim shirt. But he couldn't tell you that. Because one of the things that we do not do is we do not give boys a language to talk about their lives. We talk so much to girls about body image. We do not talk about two boys about body image and about the world in which they're coming into and the culture and what it's doing to them and their bodies and how they feel about it. So when we give boys a costume when they're five years old that has muscles sewn into every part of their bodies, not just their six packs, right? Because a generation ago, you would just get a Spider-Man costume that like we could, that, like maybe some of the men in this room, maybe some of the women, but maybe the men put on and like flew around the room. They're like, I can fly, I'm invincible. But there was no six pack put into your little costume. But this generation of boys doesn't just have six packs in the, of sewn into their Spider-Man and Batman and Superman costumes. They have muscles sewn in everywhere. But we never think about what that does to boys. We do not give them a language or even a, an awareness of, huh, we're setting you up to feel completely horrible about yourself by the time you are eight years old if you do not have a six pack. We don't think about it. We don't talk about it. So when a boy, by the time he is 13 years old, he's going to the swim party, he is getting teased, but he cannot talk about it. There's another reason why he won't talk to us and why he shuts down. It is because we often say, boys are easy, girls are hard. Boys don't fight the way that girls do. They don't tease each other, or if they do, they fight and it's over, it's done. They leave it behind. I would challenge all of us in this room to look at it differently for both boys and for girls. Number one is, is that when we say that boys are easy, it means that if they have a complicated emotional response to something, that there's something wrong with them. And it also sets up girls for saying we expect them to be nasty, conniving, little mean girls, which is also completely unacceptable. So we have to be able to give boys the right to have complex emotional lives. And that's what my keynote is about. My keynote today is about a call to action for you all to be able to talk to boys and change the way that we talk to boys, to be able to affirm their emotional rights and their emotional lives. It is also a call of action to be able to challenge the adults in the boys' lives that you know that adults must be mind, mindfully, relentlessly thoughtful about the way in which we are talking to boys and the way in which we are forcing them into roles that they might not want to be. And the other part is, is that we are forcing them to not be able to talk about their lives. And then when they don't and they shut down, we blame them for being not engaged. So uh, my keynote today is about challenging us and about challenging the adults in our lives and in the boys' lives so that we can be the adults that those boys deserve. Not just for themselves, but also for the people in their lives and for the emotional well-being of our communities. So how are we going to get there? So I'm going to show you some of the things that I think are the most important about how we get there with boys. 
And yes, I've been working like many of you for, you know, a while. We're not, you know, I always feel like I'm constantly learning. I mean, constantly, constantly, yesterday, learning new things. Today, learning new things about the work that I do with boys and girls. But what we did with Masterminds, and when I decided to do this, to really focus on boys um, about three, or three and a half years ago, was that I turned to boys and said, help me. Help me understand your world. From fourth grade through twelfth grade, we had over 200 boys help for over two years be able to give what their lives are like, what they want, and what their experiences are. Boys will talk to us if we ask them questions and we stop talking to them in sound bites and stop assuming we know what is going on in their lives. They want to talk to us. They want to meet us in a place where we can both talk and be respected and be treated with dignity. Our boys are there. They are waiting for us. So here is what I have learned. Slide, please. So this is overall, for me, about how we look at school. But this is particularly, I've been charged with talking to you about boys today. So we're going to look at it in the framework of boys. But certainly, I think this is relevant for girls and, by the way, for people who work in schools as well. So the way that I'm defining happiness is these four things. That you have meaning beyond oneself. You have, you have a hope of success. You have social connection to people who are meaningful to you. And you have satisfying work. When you have these four things, you're going to be OK. Life is going to be difficult. You're going to have conflicts. You are going to experience um, abusive power. But you're going to be able to navigate through those difficult processes if you have these four things. Now, the other issue that I want to talk to you about is about bullying. We have lots of bullying presentations. We have assemblies. We have banners. We have stickers. We have things we put on, you know, like armbands. In my experience, boys, for the most part, are completely sick of hearing about this. And they are not listening to us about it. Here are the reasons why. Number one is that the way in which we talk about building for the most part is that one person is 100% guilty and one person is 100% innocent. And so when our kids are listening to us in these presentations we do for bullying, they're thinking, mm, no, nah, I don't think so, because that kid's super annoying. So they did contribute to the problem, so I'm not going to listen to this adult who's talking to me because they don't know what's going on. That's the first thing. Number two is that we also do not acknowledge the adult's contribution to bullying. What I mean by that is, we say to kids, if you have a problem, go talk to an adult. But we don't usually talk about it in terms of well, what adult, because some adults are terrible at this. So when we say go talk to an adult, we are missing an opportunity, a huge opportunity with boys, to say to them, actually, asking for help is a, um, is a capacity, it is a skill. And so we have to actually look around the room in your life and figure out you as a process. You need to figure out who is the person that is worthy of you going and asking for help, who is competent. Who is that person for you? Because we acknowledge that not everybody is going to be so good at this. So how can we give this to you as a skill? Because not all of us are awesome at this. Number three, the reason they don't want to talk to us about bullying, is that we do not acknowledge in pretty much every bullying presentation I've ever seen, or read, or anything like that, is that we do not acknowledge that our young people see adults abuse power on a regular basis. And if we don't do this, we do not acknowledge it, our children will never come to report us, to report the problem that they're having. Why would they? Why would they report a problem about bullying if they see a teacher who is being nasty and horrible to another kid and abusing their power in the hallway, and that other teacher doesn't say anything? That, that kid might realize, like, oh, you know what, Ms. Wiseman, she's a nice teacher, but she cannot, she's looking the other way when she sees Mr. Clark tell that kid to take his, his hat off and, and, you know, down the hallway, and it becomes this huge power struggle, then that kid gets sent to detention or in school suspension. Why would I do that? Why would I have faith that this person's going to be able to advocate for me? Our children are not reporting for good reason. 
So if we see it, also, the other part is, excuse me, is that our children are having experiences of bullying in their own lives, right, with adults who are abusing power. So, of so when they see an administrator who abuses power or a coach who abuses power, that is meaningful. So when we talk about bullying, we have to acknowledge the messiness of adults' contribution to this. And that we are regularly asking young people to do things that we are not willing to do ourselves. When we acknowledge the messiness of this situation, our children will come forward. Because they trust us, because we are admitting that we are human. Now here's the other part that I found extraordinary for boys. Saying, I'm sorry. What I found is that one of the things that can happen with adults is that we make mistakes, right? I mean, one of the things that's really scary about my job, like it's scary talking to a thousand people right now, but what's really scary is, you know, much more scary is talking to a group of like seventh graders, right? <laughs> There's a constant opportunity of failure, constant opportunity that you look, especially in like our field, where we're supposed to talk to them about things they don't want to talk about, like, okay, boys and girls, let's talk about our deepest, darkest feelings about bullying, right? And they're saying, like, yeah, right, no way, no way. So it's a, what we do, one of the scare, I think, one of the scariest things about what, what we do is that we put ourselves in a situation to feel meaningless and a failure in front of 13-year-olds and 15-year-olds and 17-year-olds and 9-year-olds on a regular basis. That is not easy. But what I have found is, is that when we make mistakes, and we do, so for example, what if I teased a boy by accident and I really didn't mean it about being short? What if I made a comment about like they're lining up for pictures and I said, oh yeah, you're shorter, so like you go over here and then all the kids laughed. Well, you know for boys, being short can be really, really hard for them. So what I have done in that moment is I have, I have disconnected or disengaged the relationship I have with that kid because all of a sudden what I have said has contributed to him being embarrassed amongst his peers. That's a mistake. I could be the best counselor in the whole world and I've made that mistake. So what do I do? One of the things that I have found working with boys is they're never going to tell you that their feelings were hurt or you embarrassed them. But if you realize at the end of the day, being self-reflective or at that moment where you're like, uh, that wasn't right, that felt wrong, what I said was wrong, is that you go up to them one-on-one -on -one and you say, hey, can I just talk to you for a second? And you say, you know, I've been thinking about it. That thing I said yesterday around the pictures, that was wrong of me. Now, the, the thing that boys are going to do is they're pretty much going to say, oh, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, it's fine, right? That's what they have to say. But the most important thing is, is that you saying, I'm sorry about that, that was, actually, that was wrong of me. Whatever that kid says, even if he really wasn't bothered by it, what you are showing is that you thought about it, you cared, and that it, you cared enough to actually say to him, hey, I need to take responsibility for what I did, and I'm sorry. When we do those things, we are not only showing young people that you can make a mistake and move on from it, but we are also showing that we are thinking about them and that our relationship with them is important and their dignity is important. And that we are going to reach out and be ethical authority figures in that moment and that our authority is based on being able to say to them, I am wrong, I apologize. It is in those moments that young people go from being disengaged to being engaged. It can even be as much as, and please share this with your teachers, that one of the dumbest things, frankly, I mean, people who know me have heard me speak know I'm not exactly indirect. One of the dumbest things that people do in a class is when some kids are bullying or humiliating another kid in the class, and the teacher says, hey, Henry, that's enough. Please go back to your faculty, if you've not already done so, and say, please stop saying that's enough. Because what are you saying in that moment? You are saying that bullying up to that point, that was cool. But that line you just drew, that thing you just did, that's not okay, right? You are literally giving permission for abuse of power in the room. Not acceptable. So for the other part you could do to engage the student, say the kid that you said that's enough to, besides handling it with the perpetrator, you go to the kid one-on-one -on -one and say, you know that thing I did yesterday where I said that's enough? That wasn't right of me. I'm not going to do that anymore, I'm sorry. You get kids, whatever te you're teaching, math, science, Spanish, I don't care, you get a kid to be engaged back into the classroom in that moment. Otherwise, the kid disengages. Back to slides. 
Those words don't mean the same thing as in your generation. I don't mean anything by it. Nasty, racist, horrible, homophobic thing that they just said out their mouth, okay? So it is extraordinarily important that boys, and I'm going to stick to boys, but all children know, I can't help myself, the history of words. To be able to have constructive conversations about the history of words. And our job, I believe, as educators, is to be able to say to them that you cannot speak for other people. That when you say, oh, it doesn't mean anything, that you recognize that the, the power and the privilege that you have saying that, especially if you are in the majority. So to say a name, it doesn't matter the jokes we say or the words we use. For us to be able to explain to young people the amount of pressure that is put on the kid who represents or personifies the word that is being used, it is too much pressure on the shoulders of that one child to be constantly fighting every battle about whatever ignorant, racist, homophobic, ridiculous thing that somebody says. It is our job to be those, that ethical authority figure and not to be bowed, not to be shaken up or not to be off our game or just to say the words, that's inappropriate but to say you need to know the history, your history, collectively, about the words that we use. Now, I'm going to go back to, I'm going to go to how I differentiated for boys and um, how this works for boys and what I'm trying to convince them to listen to what I'm saying. So it was really helpful for boys to be able to differentiate what teasing and bothering means. Because young people, when they report to, as you know, right, when they report to an adult, is they usually start with some kind of extremely generalized comment, like, they're bothering me. And so the best response is, well, I'm not really sure I know what you mean by that. So can you give me a bit more, a little bit more description so I understand it better? And then to be able to define it by good teasing, ignorant teasing, or malicious teasing. So good teasing is that you feel liked by the person, you don't feel put down, and they're going to stop if you ask. A group of boys can tease each other and say the nastiest, rudest things to each other, right? They are bonding. This is good times. They are sitting on a couch playing. This is, I'm going to say something you probably don't like. They're sitting on a couch eating Flaming Hot Cheetos, Dorito, no, Cheetos, with the lime, and they're playing Call of Duty, and there's like blood all over the screen, and they are totally being horrible to each other. They are so happy. <laughs> I don't really want to deny them. I mean, would I swap out the Flaming Hot Cheetos? Absolutely. I would prefer that for a lot of different reasons, right? Like not having bright orange fuzz on my, carp on my couch. Um, it's incredibly addictive. They're totally, you know, they're terrible for you. Like all of those things. I get that. But for the moment, I want to focus on the bonding and the good feeling that happens with boys on the couch, eating chips, playing Call of Duty. Now, that is good stuff. They can say horrible things to each other, and they're like, this is good, I'm feeling really loved. Seriously. Now, ignorant teasing. Ignorant teasing is that the person doesn't know how you feel, and the way they respond, and of course, they can know what's going on, so this is what's really tricky, and this is as tricky in boy world as it is in girl world, is that people say, I was just joking, relax, don't be a fag, don't, don't when you're little, like for those of you working with little ones, don't be a baby. By, you know, I think by third grade, fourth grade, you're hearing third grade, you're hearing don't be, um, like, the, don't be a baby. Let me say it to this way. It goes from, I think, in third grade to fourth grade, unless your kids are extremely advanced, um, it goes from like don't be a baby to don't be a pussy, basically in about fourth grade, right? You literally go from that, ext from that extreme. That's, how, that's what my experience is. So it is really important, though, to understand that young people, that young boys understand the mechanisms of silence. And this goes back to what I said about words. Is that the people usually are who are saying it doesn't matter, whatever we say, it doesn't matter, are usually not the person who's actually on the receiving end of that word. So they actually don't really have the right to be saying and defining that experience for everybody in the room. We as educators of young people's social and emotional learning and, and ethics and core, because that's what we are, is that our job is to be able to say to them, there are times when you actually might say something and you're speaking for someone. 
And it's very difficult when you're the other person to speak out because you don't want to. Because if from the time you were little, if you complained about something you didn't like, it would come on you of like, don't be a baby, don't be gay, don't be a faggot, shut up. Which is basically what that is, just shut your mouth. Because I get to say whatever I want to say. And if you can't take it, then there's something wrong with you. Malicious teasing is this. Malicious teasing is your tease for your insecurities, you are uptight, excuse me, or threatened with ending the friendship or the association if you can't take it. And it is relentless and it is in public. So there is a world of difference between good teasing and malicious teasing. So when we can differentiate these things for the boys, they don't feel so weak for having a problem with whatever is going on. So we need to be able to differentiate for them what is their experience. Now, for those of you who might have read any of the things I do, you know, you know that I'm constantly giving scripts and situations. Um, and that for those of you who don't, this is my version of conflict resolution, which is called SEAL. Now here's the deal for whatever program that you work, trying to get kids to come take the bad feelings in their stomach and put it to words, okay? Starting at about eight, I think we need to preface what we're saying to kids as this. Okay, I'm about to tell you something like about how you frame your words when you're mad at somebody, but I know that it can come across as really cheesy. I know that it can come across as like, okay, this is weird. We need to acknowledge how weird it is what we do and what we're teaching these kids about like conflict res, restorative justice, anything like that, because it is a little cheesy. If you think about it, like let's not be so, we can, these issues are serious, but we also have to think about the way it comes across to young people. So when we're talking to them about like, okay, boys and girls, we're going to talk about how you talk about your feelings, we need to say, this is awkward, right? It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. It feels weird. It's okay to say that because otherwise it's what's in the kids' heads and then it's just harder to actually get them to invest in what you're talking about. So when I do SEAL and I teach SEAL, and here are the four steps of it. So the four steps are you stop, breathe and listen, think when and where, now or later. Like when? When am I doing this? I do it a little bit, do I do it publicly? Do I do it privately? How do I do this? The, then the next step for me is you explain what happened that you don't like and what you want, which is really the opportunity for us to talk about normalization. So yesterday when I was talking to some of the people in this room about video games, one of the things, and like what is normal when you're working with boys today, it is normal in middle school, as in common, for a boy to take a backpack, you know, take, he, has, he sees his friend's backpack, knows his phone is in the backpack, knows the password to unlock the phone, because they've been friends since third grade, takes the phone out of the backpack, unlocks the phone, drops the phone down his pants, takes a picture of his genitals, and either sends it to a, a pic, you know, the picture to a girl for, that either he has a crush on, or there's a variation on the theme. He has a crush on, or a girl that everybody is teasing, or like is the like sort of lowest on the social, social you know, structure of the school, sends it to her, or sends it to a boy and says, I love you, I want to have sex with you. And that's, be, I'm being super polite, because we're in a keynote, and I already said one bad word, so I've sort of done it, right? So it is in real, okay, so he sends it over, boy doesn't know, finds out when he gets hauled into your room or to the vice principal's room because he has violated the technology policy of your school for sending child pornography, and he's like, are you kidding me with this, right? Okay, so that's common. It's so common that the boys are like, this is what we just do. Ha, 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 this is funny. We need to be able to say, just because it's common, doesn't make it right. Just because you're white and you think you can say Mexican jokes doesn't make it right, for example. For example. You affirm and acknowledge. You affirm your right to be treated with dignity and with worth. That you have the right to be treated with dignity and worth when you walk through the hallways or wherever you are. That that is the, what you get inherently. And that you have to acknowledge anything that you did that contributed to the problem. This is not blaming people for what, they, for what happened to them as a result. But we cannot, as empathic as we are in this room, it is not all about, it's not all about the person's rights. 
It is not. It is also about responsibilities to other people. It is also about being able to say that there are sometimes a mix of these conflicts, right, where both people are contributing. If we do not do that, it doesn't give people reality, sort of the reality of what we do. How do we respond? And the last thing that I do for SEAL is that you lock in the friendship, you take a vacation, or you lock it out, because for boys also, not just girls, we need to have, give them boundaries, very clear boundaries about what they want in a friendship and what they don't want. Now, they do not have to have stop these dysfunctional relationships just like girls overnight, right? We don't, it's unrealistic for us to say to them, okay, well, now that you see that your friendship is totally bad for you, that now you have to stop it right now. What's imperative, just like for girls, is to be able to say, what are the things that you have to have in a friendship? What are those three things? What are your unbreakable things that you must have? And if the boys say loyalty, which they will say, then one of the most important pushbacks that I'm asking you to think about, to talk to them about, is what does that mean? What does loyalty mean? Because in boy world, loyalty is co-opted all the time. So that boys are doing things out of loyalty to back up somebody with more social power as if that is the ethical choice. That is actually a power choice. The true loyalty is speaking truth to power. And being able to do that and separating the difference between true loyalty and fake loyalty is transformational for boys because this stuff is so confusing. It is so confusing to them to be in relationships with their male friends, their closest friends, and have this horrible feeling that they're being manipulated and know they're being manipulated, can't put it to words, but because boys are easy, they're not supposed to have these problems, and if you have a problem with the boy, you're just supposed to fight it out. Well, why would you fight? Why would you actually fight, like your friend, over a loyal issue of loyalty? So we are not giving boys the lay of the land like we often give girls. Now, they might not, girls, by the way, of course, may not agree with us about the way in which we talk about girl world or any of those things, but at least they have the language and a structure, most girls have a language and a structure and know that they can go to an adult and talk about these things and the adult will know what they're talking about. There is a common agreement that these things are occurring. In boys' friendships, there are betrayals, there are complexities, there are heartbreaks, and they, we are not giving them a language or an affirmation that these friendships are complex. What we say is they're simple. Now, the other part about SEAL is that we also, when we're talking about cheesy, like this is cheesy, right? I say this to a group of kids, they're like, yeah, this is cheesy. I don't want to do this. Ms. Wiseman, you might be okay, but I'm not doing this, right? Is that we have to be able, as part of SEAL, to talk about the pushback. We have to talk about what are the things that people will do that will annoy you and get like you so annoyed or manipulate you or shut you down, and that's called the pushback. And kids love to come up with the pushback. And you will find out how the, what the boys, if you ask boys what the pushback is in their various situations, you will find out what is really truly going on in the relationships. How are the boys, what are the mechanisms in the boys' relationships that are shutting them down? Now, all of this to say, you can say it's cheesy, you can say all this stuff I just said, and they're still going to be like, yeah, I want to do this. So in the last six months, this school year, having learned the things that I learned from working with the boys with masterminds, I came up with a different way of approaching it that if this is helpful to you, it has been helpful to me. So I want you to imagine, I hope that this, I mean, you know, this would be an easy visualization for you all, that you are in your school's auditorium or cafetorium, my favorite word. And say the kids are on bleachers. Say you have to do an assembly because you've been told to do a bullying assembly or something, and you're, all the kids are on bleachers, and I mean, I really, truly, truly, how do we expect 13-year-old people or 9-year-old people, I don't care how old you are, to be sitting on bleachers for 45 minutes and not be uncomfortable, right? No back support, it hurts your butt, yet we expect our children to be extremely, extremely well-behaved sitting on bleachers, right? So there's that. So imagine you're sitting, you've got 100 kids, and they're on bleachers, and your AV is horrible, and every, like, you know, like you try using the mic, but it's going, all that horrible stuff, right? So let's just get to a place. Let's go back to school for a minute. Here's what I did this school year that worked really well. What I did was I compared doing SEAL with preparing to do a battle in a video game. 
So what I did was I said, okay, so for those of you who like do any kind of any kind of game, like where you're doing any kind of battle or competition, what do you do to get ready? Now I want you to think about this. If you had just pick any group of kids, fifth grade boys, sixth grade boys, seventh grade boys, eighth grade boys, you're talking to them about conflict resolution. You're talking to them about SEAL. SEAL's super boring. They're like, yeah, whatever, I don't care. And then the person says, so what happens when you get ready to do like a battle in a video game? The brains totally turn on. It doesn't matter if it's Madden or NBA 2K14 or Skyrim or Call of Duty or Halo or doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So what do you do when you get ready for a battle? The boys immediately, I've done this three times, I'm three for three, okay? In a large group of kids, which is really hard, bleachers. They raise their hands and they're like, well, I get ready. Like I get my cloak, I look at my, what my weapons, I get like, I see what my health is, I do my life, like what my strength is. You've got everybody up, hands up. I check what my stats are, I check where my dragon is, I do all this stuff, right? Okay, so you get ready, you prepare for what you need and what's, what's your strength? Yes. Okay, do you think about where you are? Absolutely. I think about where I am, like I'm on a hill, I'm down here, I look at my map, I'm, oh yeah, of course I do. Okay, do you also think about your opponent? Of course I do. Well, what do you think about your opponent? Well, I think about what he's got. I think about what his weapons are. I think about what his health is, his strength. I figure out like what his stats are. I think about where they are. Exactly. You think about where they are and what could they could do to push back on you, right? Yeah, totally. I'm like, I've got them. Got them. And then I say to them, all right, so when you do all this battling stuff, right, and you go into the battle, do you expect everything to go perfectly? I'm like, no. Right, okay. So you go into battle with an opponent and you go into that thinking, I'm going to do the best I can. I practice, I got all my stuff. I'm going to do the best I can. Yeah, of course. Okay, so when you go into conflict with someone in real life, is it realistic to believe that you will either be best friends afterwards or totally destroy the other person? No. And do you go, and, and like when you go into a battle, like in your video game, do you think that it would be worthwhile? You think it's still worthwhile even if it doesn't go perfectly? Yeah, of course. Well, we're going to apply the same thing to real life. The only difference is, is that the goal when you confront somebody is that you have not completely destroyed the other person, right? And that's a big difference between the battles and this, right? This is a very large difference, which needs to be emphasized. The goal, instead of totally destroying the other person, is that you have spoken your truth and, and this is where you hook them, you have a little bit of control over the situation that you didn't have before. Because if you don't be able to speak your truth, at least to yourself, about what's going on that you don't like, then that person has control over you. In that battle in your mind, you are doing nothing for yourself. So what we're doing, even just to be able to speak it for yourself, even if you never confront the other person in this moment, because unfortunately life is filled with people being horrible. So you're going to have countless opportunities to be able to speak your truth to power. In this moment, what we want is for you to have a little bit more control over the situation for yourself. So if you are 100% miserable in whatever situation you're in, you go from 100% misery to like 90% misery. Because I can tell you as your counselor, your educator, the adult in your life, I cannot take away all these problems for you, but I'm not going to treat you like you're a little tiny kid. You actually understand this because in your battles, in video games, when you go in, you don't expect to, to be completely 100%, right, not having some kind of pushback. So I'm just asking you to think about that in terms of your expectations. You want a little bit more control. And by using these kinds of tools, you get more control. That is working after, oh gosh, I don't know, 20 years of teaching kids? I cannot tell you the feeling. It's like you want to get some kind of button for yourself or award or something when you have 100 seventh graders going, yeah, yeah, totally, yes, absolutely. And honestly, I felt like there were moments this school year where I was like, yes. Of course, that of course is, you know, I've had plenty of failures where kids look at me like, oh, that's really boring, right? So we have to, we have to acknowledge that when we do things that are not hitting, and being able to be absorbed by our young people, how do we do it better? And so this is a skill, or this is a tool, that I am using right now, and I think video games are around for a little while, that is helpful to me. Next, so 
let's go, let's go to, for these boys, about how we do this bystanding stuff, because we talk about it a lot, right? We're always talking about the bystanders. So here's what I say to bystanders, or here's what I think is helpful for um, kids to hear. I'm sorry this is happening. Thank you for telling me, because I know it can be really hard to come forward about things like this. I really respect the fact that you did. Now let's think about what we can do about it. So it's really important to be able to use the word respect strategically and to be able to say, I, as the adult, respect what you did. I know it is hard. Now let's think about what we can do. Because this is a skill. And we've got to be able to affirm for the kids who come forward how much you respect the strength that they did, but to use that word. Because what I feel so strongly about is that respect needs to be used by adults in ways that make sense. Because we often say things like, with words like respect, like in sound bites, like respect yourself. Well, what does that mean, right? I mean, I respect myself and can make very bad choices, right? So it is, like the person who took the, um, see, I was about to say another inappropriate word. The person who took the picture of the genitals, right? That person is like, yeah, do I respect myself? Sure. And what I did was hilarious, by the way, right? And in fact, if the school is disciplining me about it, they are crazy and they are completely blowing things out of proportion. Now, as a bystander, I want you to think about this in terms of, you know, for young people, and especially for the men in the room, that it is, I'm going to go back to asking for help, because what we need to really connect with is asking for help being a skill, it is a hard skill, right? It looks like a soft skill, but that it is a, one of the hardest things that we do. So especially if you're male, to be able to say to them, asking for help is a skill, it is a capacity. So we're going to think through who can help you the most in this situation is a developing of social competence in that moment. It is also, by the way, calming the emotional, you can use whatever, you know, right side of the brain, amygdala, whatever you want to do, you, whatever uh, metaphors or analogies, the lizard part of your brain, whatever it is that you want to talk about with your kids, it is also engaging and quieting the emotional side of their brain. Now, let's go to this. Let's talk about the perpetrators for a little bit. So here's the deal, as you know, uh, for people who are, I know there's some first year counselors. So here's my best tip for you as a first time counselor, if, this, you've, if you have not realized this already, is that when there are altercations between children, that for the most part what adults see is the retaliation. They do not see the initiating thing that started the problem. What the problem with that is, is and it's happened to me it happens to me all the time, as a parent or as a teacher, is that you see, if you don't see the initiating situation or the problem or the push or whatever it was that started it, and then you as the adult reacts or the school, the institution reacts to the retaliation, then what happens is we discipline the retaliation, but we never address what actually happened that started it. And usually the, ch the child who started it has higher social skills than the child who retaliated. So what that means is that we are then reinforcing the power of the student who started it by our actions of disciplining ineffectively the child who retaliated. That's not acceptable because that means that the child who has the most social power has more power, like actual power, than the adult in the room or the, or the person who's disciplining them. So we really have to figure this stuff out. It is why in Masterminds I spend so much time, like its own chapter, on children who had um, low social skills. Because what I believed, I mean, on the autism scale or not, what I believe and is being borne out finally in studies this year is that the children who have low social skills are disproportionately targets or manipulated uh, perpetrators. So again, if we don't see it, we are really missing it. We are reinforcing an abuse of power that's happening in the school. So what, if a child acts out and retaliates, they need to be held accountable. But we need to be able to understand the dynamic so we can do it and hold the other kids appropriately responsible as well. So what is our goal when we are working with perpetrators? Here's the goal. Like overall, uh, overall, all, excuse me, our adult mature goal. Besides, you want to kill this kid because he's been doing this and maybe you can't catch him or you finally caught him after like 10 times. All right, so our goal is 
that they become aware of their behavior, right? They are actually aware of what they have done. Next, they are self-reflective about the behavior, the impact of the behavior on other people. They actually are aware of the fact that their behavior had an impact on somebody else. So this is where we have to say, you don't get to decide what somebody else's reaction should be or how they should define what you did to them, right? So when a kid says, well, they just blew it out of proportion, they're being overly sensitive, all of those things are non-starters, right? It's our job as ethical authority figures to say, no, actually, you have the right to your feelings about this, but that person has the right to the experience, to name the experience of what it's like to be with you. So you have to honor the impact. Oh, excuse me, this is the goal, right? These are the mature goals that we're trying to get this child to absorb, is to honor the impact of what they've done. And the last goal is to make amends personal and maybe public. These are very large goals. Okay, can we just have a moment to realize how mature you have to be to actually do these things? regardless of how old you are, really, super tough. It takes a while. It really takes a while sometimes for somebody to realize the crappy thing that they have done. And if you think about it for boys, that it feels like they're giving up power by apologizing. So what is really critical here is to remember that we're on the long road with this kid, but the problem is, is the target and the target's parents want an apology right now. And if we don't get an apology, they want, that kid, they want that child kicked out of school, like drawn and quartered, right? So that's the real rub that you've got. So how do we get to like the realistic way, right? You've got this overall sort of idealistic goal. Here's what you do. Here's, oh, excuse me, here's the child's goal, right? Damage control. They're coming into your room and they're like, how much info, they gotta figure out, how much information do you know? And they gotta like stop that information. Right? That, is the, um, that is what they are geared, very geared towards, is how do they figure out how to control you? And if you're a nice counselor, by the way, that's bad. Right? If you're like empathic and nice and kind and have all those like nice posters up everywhere with like rainbows and mountains and all that stuff, you know what I'm talking about? You people generally are very nice people. So if you've got an aggressor who comes into the room, they're like, I'm going to work this person. Right? So, damage control. They're like, I gotta control this person. So, what is, how can we handle it? So, let's think about, let's go back to some skills. And let me get some water. Next, thank you. So, what if the kid is a bully? Here's what I think about. I think about that it is, it is a one moment, it is not a lifetime. Even if they've been doing it since, like, you're dealing with an eighth grader and they've been dealing with, you've been dealing with this kid forever, because they're in your neighborhood too and you hate this child, you have got to figure out and focus on the fact that this is one moment. It is not a lifetime, right? The minute we start labeling and boxing kids into, like, you are a queen bee, by the way, um, you are a bully, we, have, we are contributing to that child not being able to break out and transition and transform into a different way of being. Whoops. Here. My go-to question is, X was reported, is it accurate? Is any of it accurate? Is 1% accurate? Because if 1% is accurate, then you're in the good stuff of, well, that's the person's experience, and you don't get to define it as anything but that person's experience. So everybody's experience is equally true. The way I say it to um, perpetrators in that moment is to say, look, I'm going to defend your right to be treated with dignity in this school as equally as I, that I'm defending this child's right to be treated with dignity. If there is something I need to know that contributed to this problem, of like what's happening to you, if there is something I need to know, then tell me. But it doesn't take away from what, why we are here. right? So if there is something you are not telling me, I need to know about that. That's important because I want to, you have the right to be here and to be treated well with dignity, with worth, just like every other child here but it does not take away from why we are here in the first place. Next, define expectations. So this is really important. This is true for both boys and girls, but really important if you have a socially intelligent boy. Sometimes those boys are tricky because they sneak. You think girls sneak under your radar this way? They are really good because we think boys don't do this kind of stuff. So I would say, this is my suggestion, use it with your own words, what, you know, how it fits good for you. If the life of the target becomes more difficult as a result, 
of them coming forward and reporting, then we will be forced to take more serious action, whatever that means to you. And you can also, if you have a good relationship with that kid, say that would be extremely disappointing to me. You know, whatever those words are that you use, but what has to be addressed with the perpetrator is that you have to be able to say, if the life of the target or the person who reported, if, that, if their life gets more difficult because of this conversation, i.e., you went out or started texting somebody the minute you walked out my door and told them to go after the kid that reported, that is a problem for me. Then that's additional level of a problem. And of course, of course, there needs to be a reintegration plan that affirms the dignity of the accused and the target. So let me say for boys in particular, and this is for those of you who work with like, with, particularly with younger kids, but I think this is appropriate for all children. Younger, in elementary schools with boys, we can be very focused on the, tr the truce, right? How do you do a truce? Truces have very little margin of error. And the most important margin of error, and this is when, like how, why? is that sometimes, and people have very strong opinions about this, like pro, pro and con, is to get an adult to have the boys come and have a truce. All right, if you have any success of this happening, the most important thing about this is, is the adult who is doing the truce, and actually it's the person who is the truce maker, has to have authority, has to be perceived as an ethical authority figure to all of the boys that are sitting around that table or on the playground. It could be a teacher, it could be a kid. It happens actually on the playground all the time with kids, where a kid who is seen as actually somebody that others trust, that he gets to decide the rules. Now for those of you, for example, I'll go to elementary school. Elementary school soccer, elementary school basketball. You wanna talk about complex social dynamics with boys? Whoever decides the redo has either tremendous social power or is perceived as an ethical leader. And that the boys would actually listen to the redo it has to be one of those two people. That's the only people that get to call a redo and other people listen. So when we think about being able to get boys together, if the person is perceived, and I'm, I know like this can be hard, but if it is perceived that the person who is doing the truth is either weak, really nice and kind, and is gonna get worked by the kids who have social power, then when you do a truce, it will reinforce the power of the perpetrator. It doesn't matter who does it. Actually, kids, they're in truce in the world of boys. The only people who do a truce are the boys who actually have the ethical power. You don't really see a weak, nice boy managing a truce because they, you'd never get the boys together. It's only in schools where we make the boys come together, where the nice person who's going to get worked by other people, by the other boys, that we do this truce. And then we do like sometimes these friends packs for younger kids, or we do like they have to sign their name. It is infuriating to the children on the receiving end to go into those situations because they know that the kids with power, the boys with power just got away with it. So we have to be able to strategically think through, and remember I said when I started, to be mindfully reflective about ourselves and how we are contributing for better and for worse to the dynamics of boys. We have to be able to assess our strengths and our weaknesses and to be able to say, do I get worked by a group of boys and why? why? Like, and be able to have that, that, that self-reflection and then work on, if you are going to be in this position, being able to maintain or increase your ethical authority. Now, oh wait, let's, oh yeah. <laughs> this is a little book I wrote. With a group of boys. Yes, it is true. I wrote a book with the word douchebags in the subtitle. Yep. Okay, now I wrote this as a companion piece to Masterminds because I didn't think that high school boys were going to go into like a bookstore and say, can I go to the self-help parenting section, please, and go get Masterminds and Wingmen and read about themselves because I just didn't think that was going to happen. And the other part was the men and the boys I was working with adamantly told me that was not going to happen. So what we did is, as I was writing Masterminds, I also wrote this book. Now, one of the things that's really awesome about the cover of this book is that the high school, some of the high school boys I work with designed the cover. So this is from all of this, and you, oh, excuse, all right. <laughs> so this version that I'm showing you right now is the e-version, and this is free, as in no money. 
that you can download this and a boy can have this on his phone or wherever on any kind of e-reader. And so if people are making, if the, his friends are making him miserable, he can go to page 75 and look and see what the other boys are saying about what the advice are. Because the boys and I collaborated with what the advice would be. The boys also shared their most embarrassing, humiliating stories. It, you know, it's really funny. Sometimes it's really sad, but it's, it's poignant. It's meaty. What happens if a girl just dumped you? What, you know, what paid? What if you're gay? How do you come out? What happens if your straight friend says something really inappropriate to you when you come out? How do you handle that? Go to page 122. What happens? All different kinds of questions of what happens. Now, this ebook cover, can you put it back the cover? So this has my name on it. We actually have this as a book book like an actual book, because the boys said to me it would be good if we had a book, like an actual book. So we do. Here's the deal. They very nicely came to me and said, but we don't want your, your name on the front cover, because we don't. So they let me put my name in the, like on the second or third page, but if you see the book in real life, you'll notice that my name is not there, because it is for the boys. It is for the boys. Now, the other thing about this is, is that I did this knowing that I was in a very difficult spot, and I think we all are, about language and about tone and how we reach boys. So I knew doing this, that by putting this, and this is the subtitle they wanted, that this would stop school districts from saying, oh yes, we want to use this book, right? Because one or two people maybe, and they feel, you know, I'm not going to take that away from them, feel strongly that douchebags is a bad word, and they don't think a school should be buying a book that has the word douchebags in the title. I get that, and I respect that. Um, there, are, you know, the language is not compl is the language, by the way, is way more polite than pretty much any eighth grade boy that I work with, right? But it is also you know, like really uh, maybe uncomfortable for some school districts, right? So there's a couple bad words in it. It's not all over the place, but they're there. And it is also pretty clear about what the boys are experiencing. But what I wanted is for, and I am so I got feedback today. I didn't even know from people in this room who have been using this and just taking it as a way to work with boys. So it is a free resource as an ebook, and this is a regular book that you can get, you know, just get. But the other thing that happened is that the boys um, <laughs> have, have now taken it on themselves. So what do we do? This is, um, like, how do we move on from, like, what, you know, where, where do we go from here, right? Like, and I wanted to share with you some of the things about where I'm going. Um, and then also hopefully to dovetail with what you're doing in your own programs. But before I do that, I actually realized, checking my notes, that I forgot to say something very important that I promised, I have promised, promised, promised the boys that I would say whenever I was in front of a group of parents and counselors. Okay, I almost forgot, and I would have beat myself up on the plane if I had not done this. Because um, you know, you promise kids you have to stick with your promises. Um, or you have to apologize when you don't. Um, <laughs> so. You know, here's the deal. People who uh, work with parents a lot, like experty people, uh, have often said in the last, I don't know, like a while, that when your child gets into a car that you should ask them lots of questions, right? Because they're trapped, right? <laughs> right. So boys do not appreciate that at all, at all. So one of the things that we have to do is actually stop asking our boys questions if we want them to talk to us. Here's what it feels like, as reported by the boys around the country, no matter what socioeconomic class, where they came from, how old they were, and this actually goes up to many spouses that have now read Masterminds and have talked to me, that when you see them at the end of the day and you love them and you miss them, and you, they get into the car and, they, and you say, how was your day? How was practice? Did you do your thing? Did that, what, what happened? And you're, especially if you're one of those enthusiastic parents who have like beady eyes, you know, like the beady enthusiastic eye thing, that the kid totally shuts down. And what young people have said to me, and it makes perfect sense, is that when they walk around the school, they have like a set of armor on, right? Their own personal sort of set of armor, um, no matter how fabulous the school is. And that when they get into the car, if they have an emotionally healthy, if, if, they have an emotionally healthy relationship with their parent, they get into a car, they see, or they're in their home, and they want to decompress. And so asking all of those questions is actually very stressful. And so you, now here's what happens as, you know, with our step back as counselors, is that so the usually mother asks those questions because they're trying to reconnect, and the boy shuts down, and then the mother takes it personally 
that that child is diseng emotionally disengaging from the relationship that he has with her. Please be clear with the mothers that that is actually not what is going on. It is not about them. This is not a narcissistic moment. This is actually understanding from the point of view of the child what it feels like. And so the way I've been able to do it with parents is to say, just to make it backwards, to flip it, to say, if you came home or when you, if it ever happened that you came home from work or from a really long day and your child's response as soon as they saw you was, so how was your day? Did you answer all of your emails? What about that, that, that person who sabotages you at work? Did you handle that? Do you want to do a role play? Because we could do a role play right now. And I would love to talk to you about that, right? I mean, think about it from the boy's perspective. And from some moms and some, you know, and dads, there's mixtures of this stuff, is that it also can feel like an interrogation when you come into the house. So we really need to see it from their perspective. And what I have advised, and I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from parents about, is when they get into the car, the first time you see them, they need to do their chores. Believe me, believe me, as a mother of two boys, they need to do their chores. They need to put their shoes away, right? They have to put their socks out. They just cannot drop their socks all over the house. So here's, yeah, I have like a moment. Okay. Anyway, moving on. So when that, you, they've got to do their chores. But the deal is, is that you've got to be like, hey, what's up, right? And just not like, hey, what's up? But like, hey, you know, what's up? You can listen to music. You get to veto the music if you want. Um, one of the most, the best conversations I've been having with my sons recently is they've been sharing with me some of the music that they're listening to. Some of the words are inappropriate, but wow, that's some interest. They are really listening to some interesting music and giving me the opportunity to talk to them. But if I sat with them and said, tell me how your day was, they would go, it would, every other child says is fine. Nothing. I do not want to tell you, right? So here's the deal. When we do this and we say to them, by the way, if we come to them at the end of the day and say, hey, just, just want to check in, everything good, anything you need to tell me or want to tell me or anything, we can't also expect the boys at the end of the day to say, oh, yes, and then just start blah, 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 right? They say, no, I'm good, it's fine. Just give them a kiss, say I love you, walk out. Because we are literally establishing a relationship of I see you, I let you be, but I'm here for you. The feedback I have gotten from parents, unbelievably, the boys were right. They were 100% right. That the feedback I've gotten from boys and from parents, and this is really meaningful for me about the parents, is that their sons are talking to them way more now that we have stopped asking them so many questions. And our sons are, one now first of all, they're actually wondering what's going on, and then they start talking to us about what's going on with them. Now, so my promised cat, I want to go back to the guide and about what I'm doing so that you know if, if this is helpful to you. The boys have come up with a website for the guide, and which I've put into the slides if you would like them. And so they are asking for contributions from boys, this just started two weeks ago, um, a website where boys can contribute their essays or anything that they're, any kind of written stuff that they can, that they can do, that they can contribute. I want to share with you a, just a, par a paragraph from one that we've just posted. For those of you who do not know what Tinder is, Tinder is a social dating networking site that I thought, until our high school interns told us otherwise, that was only for adults. Incorrect. High school people are using Tinder, and I thought it was sort of like this hookup kind of a thing. Like, was this was this like this new way to like hook up with people really fast, and I'm gonna have to deal with it? Parents are gonna freak out on me, and like, how am I gonna deal with this? What I have found, and maybe you have, is that Tinder actually is not that. And I'm gonna tell, say this to you from the words of um, a high school boy that we just um, posted on the website. This is from an essay he wrote. Tinder. I found the notion that my generation was in some way more promiscuous or hookup oriented was misguided. In my time on Tinder, I found that the app, often referred to as the quote hookup app by my peers, rarely acted as such. Not only did I find that neither I nor my matches, I'm not talking about his grammar, not only did I find that neither I nor my matches had any interest in meeting up, we didn't care to talk to each other. We were content to get our little nuggets of approval and validation and move on with our lives. My friends had similar experiences. The hockey player who introduced me to Tinder told me that the most progress he made was a couple of messages back and forth with one of his match matches, while a female friend of mine told me that although there were some slightly disturbing advances from some of her matches, the most contact she ever made was a few messages through the app and a Facebook friendship. 
If my generation fit the description that has been plastered on it by adults, Tinder would, be a, would have been a minefield of hormones ruled by the desire to continue to propagate the human race. However, it was the opposite, a self-obsessed, antisocial wasteland of the adolescent's search for validation. When you use this, use, I'm asking you to use what the boys are putting out for us to engage in conversation with your kids. And so here's what I want to end for you is a, is a story that I, I hope you carry with you for the, for the rest of your time at the limit, you know, dwa- waning time of the conference, is that it can be so hard, and parents feel so stuck sometimes with their sons, and boys oftentimes feel stuck with their parents. And it can feel like everything becomes a control and, a control and power struggle. And so when I was teaching in Massachusetts in this last year to school, I taught an assembly um, in front of a lot of kids. And I had a problem with the football team who, of course, sat in the very back. It was all a mess. It was one of those moments where I had to like exert power in an ethical way when I really didn't want to, when I really just wanted to be like not exercising authority in an ethical way. <laughs> But one of those football guys was waiting for me later in the evening um, who had come back for my parent presentation. And this was an offensive lineman, so not small dude. And um, he was waiting for me. And he said, can I talk to you for a moment? And I said, sure. And we sat aside. And a couple of guys, and I'm not, I actually don't know if, if they were people he brought or if they were just guys that were like, what's going on? I want to hear about what's going on. And he said, I need help with my dad. I'm like really, I'm so angry at my father all the time. I, I, I don't know what to do. I mean, like he was like, oh, I'm so angry. And he said, let me tell you, like yesterday, I come home and, you know, I've got homework to do. I've come back from practice. I'm like doing my stuff. I am doing my chores. I'm doing it. I'm sitting at the table doing my homework. And my dad comes up to me and says, have you taken out the trash? And I say, I'm going to do it in a minute. And he says, fine, then you're going to do the trash for the month. And he said, like, every conversation I have with my dad is like this, and I hate it. I just look at him now with hatred. He does not listen to me. I was doing my homework. I hate it. What do I do? Now, the kid had come to me because he cared about this relationship with his father. The meaningful relationship that he had with his father was being frayed by these constant power struggles. So what do you do? I sat with him and with these other couple boys and talked about how he could use SEAL to be able to transform or be able to talk to his dad without it being a power struggle. So I said to him, like, when is your dad the most relaxed at any point when he comes home? And he said, when he comes home, Monday nights when he watches football. I said, okay, so when that happens, the next time, during a commercial break, mute the TV during a commercial break. So that means you've got approximately three minutes. And then what I want you to do is I want you, and then we walk through the seal of saying, Dad, right, last week we are having this thing with the trash and say exactly what he doesn't like. He needs to acknowledge that maybe when he says in a minute, that his version of in a minute is different than his father's version of in a minute, right? Because our kids say in a minute and then they don't do it. So there needs to be an acknowledgement of that. We talked about it. Big dude. A couple of days later, because of course he didn't tell me, and I'm like thinking a lot about it, so I wrote him and said, hey, talk to me about what happened. And I get back within a minute this incredible email. I did it. I was so scared. I did it. We're sitting there, and it worked. I talked to my dad, and it worked. It is so much better. Now I want you to imagine this big boy like sitting like in a barca lounger or on the couch watching Monday Night Football with his dad, who's probably not that small either, and that they had had you know, these conversations that had just been butting heads and that they're sitting there watching Monday Night Football and they're talking. Did that talk last for an hour? No. Were there maybe more than 10 words exchanged? I doubt it. But they were able to transform and to be able to move past that feeling of being so stuck. So what I want you to think about with boys is this. I started off with you about saying this is a call of action, and I mean it. And you will notice that I didn't talk about the horrible statistics about boys because you know that there are boys who are in crisis. I don't need to tell you these things. You have boys that are in crisis. Whether they're showing it or not, you know that you do. And so what this is, is again, being mindful of ourselves 
It is being able to speak to other adults about saying to them how we are contributing to boys not coming forward. And as I was thinking about it right before I came up here, this thing came to me that what we're really doing at base is that this is a call of action for meaningful and, transform and transformative silence about how to be silent with our boys and be comfortable with that. It is a call of action of meaningful and transformative words, that our words matter and that we listen to boys, that we truly listen to what their experiences are. And it is a call of action of meaningful and transformative actions, because that is what, at base, all of our children deserve. Thank you very much. Oh, wait, let me do this. Here, let me give this to them. Bye. Thank you, Richard. Oh, sure. Okay. Well, Rosalind, thank you so much for sharing your story and for all you do for education. Um, as a father of two boys myself, I, I found her words very meaningful and I hope helpful even though they're older. Um, Rosalind will be signing copies of her books upstairs um, at our bookstore, so please stop by. Uh, we have uh, Queen Bees and Wannabes and Masterminds and Wingmen outside the hall as soon as the general session is over. Um, the 2015 ASCA annual conference spikes up your school counseling program, as I've said a few times, will be held next year, uh, June 28 to July 1 in Phoenix, Arizona. Yes, we're looking forward to that. Uh, the call for proposals will be, um, oh, I'm sorry, the call for proposals is now open on the ASCA website, and we hope you'll all be able to uh, submit a proposal and join us in the land of dry heat. <laughs> There's so much uh, to see and do, you won't want to miss a minute of it. Um, right now, thank you so much for joining us, for sharing part of your summer with us. Uh, we hope it's been uh, beneficial for you and entertaining and as meaningful for you as it has been for the entire ASCA board and staff. Uh, see you next year in uh, Phoenix. Safe travels.